Hi there, I'm Chris. I am the CEO of Swiftcom. We're a South African based company. We focus on headless e-commerce, specifically building sites that are affordable. Since headless is a very new concept, or relatively new and specifically in our country, it's still very expensive. And our aim in Swiftcom is to make headless affordable and also make it possible for many businesses to use this technology. So I want to be, I want to show, take this opportunity to show you what we've done, what we've built with our WordPress and WooCommerce backend, as well as our Gatsby JS frontend. And the main reason we have decided to go for this technology and why we decided to ultimately use this is because a lot of sites, when you build the, the e-commerce website, the backend process stays the same. So the way the commerce works, the reporting, the orders, shipping calculators, payments, all that stuff, it stays mainly the same. Now, I mean, there is a difference between Magento and Shopify and WooCommerce, but it's very similar. A lot of the changes always lies in the front end. How does the front end look? How does it function? How does it feel? What are the colors? How does the graphics look? How does it look on mobile? How do you search? How do you navigate? So all, all those changes mostly lie in the front end. Now, if you think about this in a traditional shop, shop um, setup, you get instances where, let's say you go to one kind of shop and another kind of shop. The checkout process is always very, very similar. You take items, you stand in a queue, you get to the toll, they ring it up, you pay for it and you leave. That's very similar. But the shopping experience, the salespeople, where you find the items, how you buy them, how it's laid out, the look and feel of the shop, that is often very customized between two, two different franchises or two different shop types. So if you think about a grocery store or a hardware store, most of your changes is in the representation and not really in the commerce or checkout process. And it's very similar with e-commerce. You get very similar feels when you do checkout and payments, but when you get to the actual shopping part, that is where the customization happens. And we found that it's always very difficult with an analytic app such as WooCommerce to make these changes. Since your shop or your commerce and your shop is intertwined, it's very difficult to actually make those changes without influencing the different layers. And that is why we decided to go for the headless route. So without further ado, that's a brief explanation. I'll show you what we've built. I'll show you the features. I'm not going to go into the code today. Maybe we can make a separate video for that. And um, yeah, I hope you enjoy the video and let me dive right into it. So what you're seeing in front of you here is our headless front end. Um, it's built by Netify, which is a very common technology. There are many different kinds of these services, but we decided on Netify for now. And then we also have our WordPress and WooCommerce backend. This is not a live site. We took one of our clients products and we just imported it into the SaaS backend to show the demo. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to first start by showing the front end because that makes logical sense and then I'll go back to the back end and show how we did the various different parts. So on the home page we have a few basic elements. We've got a blog element. There is no on no blogs on this side so it's just showing nothing. We've got top sellers with a carousel that's scrolling through. We've got a button to the shop and a nice footer. We've also got some links and a newsletter and, and a bunch of different things. Um, we got an intro banner slider. I'll show briefly how this can be customized from the back end a bit later. We've got, there's generally a top menu, menu in the top left, but for this site it's hidden. What I'll do is I'll actually go and log in. So we obviously have a registration page as well. You can register as an indi individual or as a business. So what I'll do for now, I'm not going to register since I already have an account. So I'll just go back to the login screen. I'll type in my details. And then it's actually going to send me to the login page. So what just happened is a few API calls happened from my browser using JWT authentication directly to the backend. So this screen actually changed its state. So although I was on the same page, it did the API calls, authenticated the backend, checked my user, a whole bunch of stuff, and then logged me in. I can obviously log out straight away, but I'm not going to do that right now. I'm going to show the account screen first. So firstly, we've got a billing details page. Um, on this page, you've got your name and surname, company details, um, a random billing address. And this can be, so what we've actually done is we've linked this to the shipping address. So if I just search for something such as um, Pretoria, South Africa, that's where I'm at at the moment, I'll save these changes. And you can actually see it also changed the map as I did the address search there. If I go back to the billing details, it would have pulled that information through. And I can also choose to change these details if I don't want it the same. Now what this will actually do is it will send this information to the WooCommerce backend. You have a billing and shipping address by default. So if you don't tick this, it will use the same. Um, if you tick it, it will use the same address. If you don't tick it, you can set a different billing address should you want to do so. For now, I'm just going to leave it ticked since 
that's not really important. We've got an order history screen, so this is basically showing all, all the orders I've placed on this website. I see it might be getting stuck there brief, briefly. What always happens when you're doing a demo of the software. I think it might be that I don't have any orders. So let me just get back to this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the shop page. We've got a lot of different categories that are generated dynamically from the back end. We've got filters. So these are actually your attributes and variations. Um, and the attributes can be used to filter the products on the front end. Um, these filters work instantly as you tick them. So you can see it's super fast to, to find products. And what we also do is we show at the top as you tick some filters, we will show which filters are actually active. So if I select the color, for instance, and I scroll up and that's been selected, I can then also clear that. We also have a few sorting mechanisms. These are fairly straightforward. And um, yeah, that's pretty much the shop page. On the product page, we support variable products. So different sizes and variations will show up on this dropdown. And as you can see on the shop page, it will actually generate a product card for each variation. So in this case, six, three, four, five, those are just the different sizes. But if, if you look at the bottom left of the URL, if I actually click on it, it will pin this to the URL and pre-select the correct variation already. Um, yeah, on the product page, we, we can also add dynamic tabs. So currently we just have reviews, but in the back end, I'll show a bit later, you can actually add different tabs and rows and stuff for information. We've got a leave a review section. I see it's unfortunately a bit broken here, but this will basically send a review to this product on the back end, which you can approve. And then at the next build with the GraphQL query, this will be actually be queried and then show, show them on here. I'll go through and actually show a checkout process. So I'm adding this product to the cart. I, my cart already had some stuff, which is now fetched from the back end. It's very easy to increase or decrease quantities. All of this is actually happening as API calls to the server. So what I'll do is I'll just briefly show that. If I show in the network tab, go back to the cart, maybe just increase the quantity here. You can see it's doing that API call to the back end directly. And this is actually a custom endpoint that we wrote because it requires shared WT authentication. We couldn't use the default WooCommerce endpoint. So we wrote a custom one that, that supports this. And that's the PHP plugin that I've been talking about in the start. Um, we can also do promo codes, so whatever rules work in the WooCommerce backend will also work on this front end. It supports the entire promo code system from WooCommerce. Next, if you go to the checkout page, you notice at the top left it's loading. Again, you can have your billing details section, so you can choose. We actually have courier and collection, so if you choose collection, it will actually look for available provinces automatically and branch, branches in those provinces that you can collect from. So that can all be set from the back end. I'll show that a bit later. Um, but for this case, we'll just select courier. It will, again, I can change my billing details over here if I want to. And for now, I'll just keep these shipping details as is. We also have a dynamic shipping calculator, which you can set, change on the WooCommerce shipping settings page. So you can set your rules and your stuff over there and that will actually calculate the shipping cost based on the distance from the warehouse. So there's a various different rules and stuff that you can change in the WooCommerce um, shipping settings page. We support quite a few different payment methods. These are all also within the plugin and rendered on the front end dynamically. For now, I'll just choose the EFT option and pay for the order. This is going to go to the order summary page. And hopefully, there we go, redirect me to the order success page with a bunch of different details. All of this is fetched from the back end. So whatever banking details you put into the EFT method on the back end will show up here, as well as the message and so on and so forth. I'm not going to show contact us and about us and blog for now. Those are not really commerce pages, but they are also pages that we generate from the back end. Um, in order to keep the video not too long, I'll go back to the back end and then start showing features there. Maybe just for one last feature, we've also implemented Algolia Live Search. So the browser is actually sending a live search request to the Algolia and then returning the results. And then if I obviously click on it, it will go to those corresponding products. Just want to quickly see if this order history is working now something might actually be broken here. That's quite odd. But in any case, we show all the products, the details of the order payment method, etc. It, it just seems broken now for some reason. It's just stuck on loading. Okay, so on the back end, um, I think I can just go and show you the order that I just placed. So if I go into that order, it's showing obviously one minute to go. Let's wait for this to load. Here we go. So it's showing my real IP. It's showing notes. So if you're using an online payment method, it will show all the relevant messages there. It's showing the billing and shipping addresses. I kept those the same. So as you can see, they are the same. 
and it's showing all the information of the order, all the products. It's also showing which branch it actually delivered from. So from that test one, it calculated that this is the closest, the weight was just one, and then it calculated the estimate, and it was not over distance, so that is why it got to the shipping cost that it, that it got to. So maybe, yeah, I mean, these are standard WooCommerce orders pages. We also store some additional metadata down here. In the settings page, if I go to shipping, there's a WooCommerce or a Swiftcom shipping method that we have in here with a bunch of different rules. So you can configure the Google API key, different messages, your base costs, uh, cost per kilometer, weight rounding, overage distances. So we try to make this quite dynamic so it can be changed on a per site basis without actually modifying the front end code. On product level, I'll briefly show this. Wait for this to load. There we go. We've also integrated this with Yoast, so it's pulling all the data from Yoast SEO onto the front end, generating open graph previews. It basically supports all the data that Yoast will output normally and then but just in Gatsby. So we have product short description, data fields. As you can see, this is a variable product. We've got product information, so this is the tabs I was referring to. You can give a tab a name, and in the tab you can give rows, so row one value one and you can add more rows and more tabs and then those will dynamically be generated on the front end when you go to a product it's not going to show here now because i'll have to read a trigger a rebuild but it will generate a tab here with the information in the tab as um, tabs and columns so yeah that's pretty much the product page it supports all the default woocommerce stuff prices published or not um, yoast variations variation prices stock levels etc etc so all of this has been integrated into the front end to, we've actually made a custom settings page. I'll go onto that now. Here are all the branches with operating hours, um, shipping estimates. Do they do collect and collections deliveries? Do they appear on the contact us page? Maybe I'll just briefly show that. So, because the site has multiple branches in the back end, it's actually generating multiple branches on the front end, which you can then see by going to the branch and showing the embedded address over there. So, in the back end, you can tick all these boxes. So, for instance, if you wanted to have four branches but only do deliveries, from one, then you'll just untick these on all the different branches. We have global site FAQs. So if our global FAQs page is generated from this, so whatever you put, this is the topic and then the FAQ question and answer. So these all have the same topic and then they have different titles and content, which are the questions and the answers. The logos and the colors can all be changed. This is dynamically generated on the front end. So if you change the logo or the colors, the front end will, at the next rebuild, it will pull all that information from the back end and dynamically build a new front end for you. We've also added the social platform icons. Um, those are in the footer with their corresponding links. Lastly, we have an admin section. So this is a, a key that, that the front end uses to bold to authenticate. API calls, we have a wish list that you can enable and also the front end URL. This is the URL that you want your front end to have when it's built. Now obviously this is using a Netlify URL but there are a few things such as the sitemap that are um, dependent on this field to know what the final URL is actually going to be when the site was generated. Our wish list is also just a feature where it, it shows up over there if I enable it. So maybe what I'll do is I'll quickly enable the wish list and I'll do an update. And then I'll, do, I'll trigger a bold. So I'm just triggering a bold of the master branch. This is going to take about, um, let's see the last bold, it took about eight minutes, but generally it's three or four minutes. So what I'll do is I'll just stop the video and continue the video when this is done and then show you that as I tick this box in the back end, the front end actually regenerated with that feature now enabled. And the reason we put this under admin is this is a feature we might want to control ourselves, whether we give that to the client or not based on a package or whatever that they take from us. So what I'll do is I'll stop the video here and just come back when that's done. Right, so we're back and the build is successfully completed. As you can see, it took about nine minutes at this stage. We need to optimize that a bit. It's taking a bit of a while, but in any case, as we can see, if we go back to the front end now, there is a wish list that appeared by simply just ticking that box from the back end. So if I go to Swiftcom Admin, you can see that I've ticked that box now. So if I go and add a product to my wish list, it will appear in the wish list and we've also built in a feature that can either move specific products or all products to the cart. So I can go ahead and do that. 
Here we go. So as you can see, it moved that product from the wishlist to the cart. And the reason we did this is just to basically split up features that are bound to packages, as I mentioned earlier, and can be enabled and disabled by just a click of a button and the front end reacts to that. The last thing I want to show in this video is how we did the components on the front end. So the slider, for instance. If I go and edit the home page, we've got a bunch of shortcodes on this page. And the sliders have been built into shortcodes. So you can see that the banner carousel item starts there and it stops there. And then each slider is a carousel item with account that has an image, or this one doesn't have an image, this one has an image, with a title button. And you can also add some text if you want to do that. The front end then uses that information to generate this slider component. The idea is also to add various different sliders. So we currently just have banner carousel, but we might have different banner carousels with different IDs or as the shortcodes in the front end would simply detect that and then build the component. Everything such as shop by category has also been implemented using shortcodes. The title can be parsed using the title over there. And you can also pass styles and, and stuff, different options, the blog component and the top seller, sellers carousel can also be passed in that way. And the reason for this is to make it easy for the customers to edit components, move them around without actually having to modify the code at all. So the customer would be able to swap around the blog and the top seller section by simply moving the short code in the back end above the other one or wherever they want to. So this is probably not the best and most intuitive system, but it's just a way for clients to do that easily without having to ask the developer to do that all the time. I think that is pretty much it in terms of our framework. If you have any additional questions or if you enjoyed the video, please do let me know in the comments either on the video or on Reddit. And then if we have enough interest and we have you know, additional questions or things, we might be able to make a second video, maybe to go into some code, how we actually built the endpoints, etc. And if there's a lot of interest, we might be able to open source the plugin or something in those lines for more people to actually use this. And that's it for now. Thanks for your time for watching. I really appreciate it and have a great one.